Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Longevity Center webinar this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. And our topic today is the specter of ageism and ableism, resurrecting values and positivity in the time of pandemics. Now, before we get started, I, I just want to review a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, if you hover your mouse uh, at the bottom of the Zoom panel, you can see a Q&A. So if you have any questions during the course of this webinar, please uh, chime in. Uh, we welcome your participation. Uh, feel free and I'll try to integrate those questions into the conversation throughout. And um, we will, we're gonna experiment this time. We're gonna take a poll at the beginning and I want everyone to know that when we uh, take this poll, it will be complete, completely anonymous as to what you answer. So uh, no concerns about that. So let's get right into the topic today. Oh, and also let me, let me just thank a few people. I wanna thank Ernie from our tech department who does a, a great job. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our Longevity Center staff, our board of directors, all of our members, and of course, all of you who took the time out this, this afternoon to join us for this conversation. <clears throat> so this COVID-19 pandemic has really changed our lives in a lot of ways. It's affected us personally, our family lives, our other relationships, our financial lives. And as a result of this crisis, the existing social and economic inequalities, as well as racial and ethnic disparities, have heightened the vulnerabilities among low-income workers and ethnic and racial groups. It's also raised the specter of discrimination against older and disabled people, what's known as ageism and ableism. Today, we'll be discussing these issues and more with our esteemed guest and my longtime friend, Fernando Torres Gill, whose multifaceted career spans the academic, professional, and policy arenas. He's a professor of social welfare and public policy at UCLA, where he's also director of the UCLA Center for Policy Research on Aging and an adjunct professor of gerontology at USC. He also has served as acting dean and associate dean at the UCLA School of Public Affairs and chair of the social welfare department. Professor Torres Gill has written or co-edited seven books and over 100 publications, including his most recent book with Jay Engel on the politics of a major, of a, on the politics of a majority minority nation, aging, diversity, and immigration. His academic contributions have earned him membership in the prestigious academies of public administration, gerontology, and social insurance. His research spans the importance of the important topics of health and long-term care, disability, entitlement, and the politics of aging. Fernando, welcome to our webinar. It's delightful to have you with us. So uh, Ernie will Get your picture up there and we'll be able to say hello. hello. Great to see you again. Thank you, Dr. Small, if I may call you Gary, since we We're having a little bit of uh, trouble with the audio. So uh, maybe uh, Ernie, you could uh, email Professor Fernando Torres Gill an audio, a phone connection in case he needs it. Try it again, Fernando. Testing, Say, testing. Oh, much it's better. Good be, it's good to be with you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you now. So let's let's get right into, actually, before we get into the conversation, I wanna try this poll out with, with our guests today. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the big topics we're talking about today is ageism, and that's really discrimination, discrimination against older adults. And in fact, uh, you know, it's a presumption that older adults are frail, weak, and disabled. And it, and it probably permeate, permeates our society. And it was a term introduced in 1968 by Robert Butler, who became the first director of the National Institute on Aging. Both Fernando and I 
uh, knew him. He coined the term to refer to these negative stereotypes, discriminations, and prejudice that older people face. Now, to kind of bring everyone into the conversation, Ernie has, uh, is going to allow us to do a, a doodle poll or a, a little poll here, and we'll see what the results are. And I want each of you to ask yourself this, and uh, the poll should pop up. Can you pop, pop it up now, Ernie? There we go. How many of you at home have ever experienced agent, ageism? Not at all, somewhat, very much, or almost always? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, and everybody else should answer and submit their results. And we'll know how many of you are, I know how many of you are on the line, and I thank all of you for the, the big crowd, and we'll see how many of you participated in the poll, which may be a reflection of your interest in the question or your ability to manage Zoom, which really uh, daunts us all from time to time. And so the results are, Ernie, how did we do? Okay, so 27%, not at all, 60% somewhat, 11% very much, and 2% almost always. It would be interesting, and this is not inconsistent, what we know from the data. In fact, uh, recent studies, recent polls find that for people 60 years or older, you know, they, these people are noticing they, they experience ageism, ageism. So it's really, it permeates our society, it's here everywhere. And you know, to get the conversation going with you, Fernando, I, I wanna just start with, you know, usually I ask people for a biography when they come on the <laughs> webinar. And you, yours was, was great because you included a quote from Hubert Humphrey, which I thought was very poignant. And I'm gonna read that quote, and then I want you to just reflect on it. Why, you know, why that touched you, and that might, uh, start the conversation. So Hubert Humphrey said, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the aged, and those in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Fernando, talk to us about that. Thank you. And again, it's a great pleasure to be with you and forgive me for my uh, high tech issues here. I trust you can all hear me fine. Am I okay, Dr. Small? A little distorted, but stay with it. I think we can, we can do okay. Okay, very good. Well, that quote in part reflects one of my themes or messages from today's webinar that I believe we're once again be reconsidering a social contract that brings us together that addresses the vulnerabilities we will all face, whether we're young, middle-aged, or older. And this renewal of a social contract, we saw that in the 1960s from the civil rights and the social turmoil. We saw that in the 1930s and the 1940s during the Great Depression and World War II. And I believe we're now at a point where we have such divisions, such I'm hoping and I believe that this kind of quote reminds us that we once, and I think this quote really talks about what that social contract should be. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to go right to a may, maybe a, a question I think is on people's minds today. And uh, actually delving a little bit more into, not, may not be on everybody's mind, but it's certainly on your mind, it's on my mind. And that has to do with uh, ageism in the face of this COVID-19 crisis, especially older people in nursing homes. And you know, we've heard about what's gonna happen if we don't, and we've had these situations in some states and some regions of the country, where there's not enough healthcare resources for everyone who's who's sick, and uh, you know, I wonder if you can comment on proposals for California's crisis care standards to give medical priorities toward those 
with greater life expectancies and fewer pre-existing conditions. And this gets into a little bit of ableism as well. Yes, and, uh, and that sets the stage for why I think this topic is important for all of us, again, regardless of age. And just to clarify, as, as uh, Gary, you certainly defined uh, Bob Butler's version of, by the way, is not just discrimination based on an older person, but we sometimes discriminate against persons that are younger by our misperceptions or our implicit bias. But ableism is also discrimination against those with some type of a disability, whether it's cognitive, visual, hearing, emotional, physical. As a member of the governor's master plan on aging, we confronted directly California's initial plans or crisis care standards to ration medical care in the event that we had scarcity of ventilators, scarcity of ICU beds. And the initial criteria was right up front, you said life expectancy, if you had certain types of pre-existing conditions, and therefore you were assumed to have a shorter life span that was not as productive as a younger person, that you would get fewer points and go to the back of the line. So very upfront saying, we're gonna give scarce medical care to those that are healthy, relatively young, and are perceived to be productive. And that's not just California. Tennessee, for example, came up with their crisis standards that if you were expected to have fewer than five years to live, you would go to the back of the line. Arizona right now is using their crisis care standards to disqualify persons, to, uh, to disqualify the use of ventilators for those that have a whole series of medical conditions, including dementia, spinal cord injuries, neurological issues. So, we're seeing this resurrection of ableism and ageism coming together around the pandemic. Uh, to California's good uh, credit and to Governor Newsom, once we advocated and pushed back, the Department of Public Health eliminated those crisis care, those standards based on age and disability. But other states are going to be using them we worry that Arizona and Florida may be using them given the surge that they're facing. So uh, what I'd like to talk about is the broader issues. What does that signify that we've come to a point in this pandemic where age and disability are becoming a factor? Well, you know, I think th this is a huge issue and I want to, um, you know, I want to segue a little bit because I, I just got a couple of Questions that came in. I think this doesn't get in. It doesn't get into ableism so much, but it's another twist on it. And someone commented that they believe ageism is greatly affected by sexism. For example, a woman over a certain age is deemed a spinster or old maid, or that while there are no comparable terms for an older unmarried man. So the question is: Are women more affected with, by ageism than men? What do you think? Well, I think overall, anecdotally, just an observation, and then you combine that with ageism and women as they grow older will begin to face this, whether it's in the entertainment industry, looking for a job, or whether they feel they have to color their hair so that they don't appear as old as they might be. And uh, certainly groups like the Older Women's League, which I used to belong to, the Great Panthers in the past with Maggie Kuhn, did a great job advocating on behalf of women and older women and to go against sexism. But this is really a variety of isms that are just surfacing with all the chaos that's going, we also, on and on. But if I may, I'd like to step back and provide a broader context, which I think will get us 
towards a more positive view of how we can deal with this and how we must. So Fernando, before you get into that, your voice is distorted. So I'm going to ask you to do something that might make yes. it better. Um, Let's see if we can you could, can you turn the sound down on your tablet to zero and then call in on this number, okay? And let's try the phone. So that way we can see you. The phone number is 669 900 And then the web ID number is 825 0905. 7200. Got it. Let me, uh, let me give that uh, a shot here and hopefully then I will ask for your audience patience on this. Thank you. So while we're waiting uh, for Fernando, let me just, I'm going to try this. This is another uh, thing I'd like to, to try, you know, with the q and I appreciate those who have sent in um some questions already i like everyone at home to just type in any experience they've had you know because uh, quite a number of you did say that you, you experience ageism just uh, a phrase or a sentence of the form it took for you what was the form of ageism did someone call you a name did someone ignore you so just type that in on the bottom of the screen where it says q a just tell us what you experienced. Okay, we've got invisibility. Old codger for men. Well, that Hello? kind of balances That's it. Testing. Say something, Fernando. Can you hear me? Am I back? Yeah, much better. Great. So I just Thank pulled you. the audience to see what they're experiencing in terms of ageism. We've got invisibility. Uh, they made the comments or answered toned down. Uh, you know, I've, one thing I've seen where people will speak in a louder voice and more slowly if you're old assuming that you can't understand them. Job search, bias against older people, that's definitely true. Being treated as less intelligent, being invisible, ignored because of age. You know, I gotta, that reminds me of an experience I had. And after this, I'm gonna ask you for your own experiences, Fernando. But I was uh, in Washington, DC, gave a lecture, uh, some big lecture. And before the day I was coming home, I, I was, you know, I was in the, uh, in the hotel room and I caught my baby toe against a piece of furniture and I broke my toe and it was tremendously painful and I taped it up. And so when I flew home, they, you know, they got a wheelchair for me on the airplane. And you know what? I felt invisible. It was the weirdest thing. No one looked at me. It's probably an exercise we should all go through. Tell me, you know, from your point of view, your own experiences with, with ageism and ableism, Fernando. Well, again, uh, excuse me for using my old school phone, but uh, <laughs> first I would say to your experience, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In terms of using a wheelchair, but uh, you know, I find that destiny has given me some silver linings in terms of what life vicissitudes uh, bring to one. And I'm a polio survivor. Uh, contracted polio when I was very young. So I've been aging with the disability. But I also got into the field of gerontology at a very early point in the 1970s. So I worked on issues of seniors. And I happen to also be a Latino. So uh, I'm in the middle of all these issues about racial and ethnic diversity. But uh, let me just say what's ironic Growing up as a person with a disability, certainly uh, there was a certain amount of discrimination based on ableism, meaning I didn't feel normal or I didn't feel like I could participate with my handicap 
with things that other young people did. But over the years, I find that it's actually an advantage. It has certainly taught me about adversity. But now I'm also an older person. So I'm dealing with the issues of how I'm perceived as an older person. But I think that's what's given me tremendous empathy and understanding, which is why I now devote this part of my career to advocating not just for older person, persons with disability and working with various state governments and the federal government to consolidate programs for older adults, younger persons with disability, and the in-home supportive services and community-based programs that we all need. So it has really been a great benefit for me to have those experiences. I will say this, by the way, most of us, I believe, on this audience are probably baby boomers. If you are roughly, what, 64 years of age and over? Yeah. Or 60 and over, you're part of that baby boomer cohort. And uh, Gary, if you recall back in the 1960s, when we were very young in our 20s, I think some of the famous sayings were, don't trust anyone over 30 yep. or a song, I hope I die before I get old. Yep. Isn't it ironic that now that us baby boomers are in our 60s and 70s, that we're now facing a form of discrimination that we may have put on older persons when we were young? Well, you know, we call that poetic justice. Well, I would say some of the worst ages are older people. You know? And, <laughs> but, you know, it gets into, you use the term empathy. I'm glad you brought that up. And it reminded me of another issue, you know, so as a psychiatrist, I always try to understand the psychological underpinnings of what this is about. And in thinking about it, you know, I think, you know, a, a fear that uh, we all share is of dying, of losing life. Yeah. And, and getting older sort of symbolizes that. And I think what ageism does, how it serves the, the psychological protective mechanisms is, uh, you know, you're, you're old, you're different than I am. You know, that it kind of distances you from the older person. So you don't have to worry about your own aging so much. And, and I remember I bring this up when I would uh, teach, you know, young doctors and residents, I would say, you know, to have one way to overcome your ageism is to think of older people as people, mm -hmm. to kind of break through that, uh, that barrier. What, what do you think about all that? No, very, very much so. We have our own insecurities, our own internal fears about you know, getting older and facing that, what we would call our actuarial, our actu our actuarial probability, meaning getting close to what might be the end of our lifespan. But you know, having been a board member of AARP for many years, they've come up with a slogan, which I really like to use, own your age, own your age, meaning whether you're 22 or 72, and I'm 72, feel good about that age. And also accept the reality that we've made it this far and we all have a natural lifespan if we take care of each other. And that does include accepting the end of life and planning for an end of life and finding a way to not just be comfortable with it, but to own it. Meaning, you know, this has been our passages and this is what we're going to have to accept. At least I've been practicing that. My wife and I have been planning for that. But I certainly like to reassure the audience that own your age, enjoy it, plan for that end of life. It's part of the natural process. I think it's a great way to look at it, very positive. I, I like that. I want to bring in the audience some more and just read some of their other comments of, of examples of ageism. Uh, I cannot believe you are that old. <laughs> being, being called honey. Uh, can't work technical equipment. I think, well, I think there is, you know, there's some reality this. We know from the data that uh, as people get older, they are less computer savvy. Now that's changing because many people of all ages are getting good at computers. So there can be some truth behind, behind some of these prejudices. Um, ignored, their opinions being ignored, condescension. 
uh, Department of Motor Vehicles questioning ability. Okay, now this, this brings up a, another issue. And uh, I wanted to make this also topical. Uh, and, you know, given the 2020 November elections, how might the voting influence of older adults intersect with what seems to be a youth movement of activism and progressive ideas? What do you think about that? Well, you know, are into my world of the policy and politics of aging. And I promise not to do my patented three hour lecture because I know <laughs> we only have a few minutes. But let me say uh, this, the ageism and ableism that came out of these proposed crisis care standards given the pandemic is a reflection of broader issues facing this country we are in a sense in a perfect storm not just this terrible pandemic but also the economic insecurity the realization that it brings out a host of economic and social and health disparities in other words this country has a lot of work to do to fix itself and i won't go into all the issues but it's also bringing out potential generational tensions, generational tensions. And the young people that are protesting, whether it's anti-Black racism, whether it's economic disparities, whether it's supporting immigration reform and DACA and DREAMers, it's really bringing out that younger persons in their 20s and 30s, millennials and Gen Z, and this comes out in all the polls, they feel their lives are not going to be as good as their parents and grandparents. They feel that this country has given up on a social safety net. And they feel that there isn't hope given how things have occurred and they want change. And I think that's an exciting, positive development, not unlike the 1960s and the 1930s during those social movements. However, what we're seeing out there is also a semblance of ageism. Young people feeling that older voters have not served the country well or served younger people well. And I think there's a little bit of truth to that because older voters naturally are concerned about keeping their taxes low, protecting the equity in their homes, protecting their pensions, enjoying what they have worked very hard to earn. I mean, that's, and therefore, you know, we're going to get a little uncomfortable if somebody's threatening what we have. So increasingly in the work that I do with my organization, it's, propo it's proposing and working on intergenerational coalitions, for example, and I'll be upfront and not to be political, but I think what we need post November, especially if there's a change at the top is to recreate that social safety net. For us older folks, it's protecting social security. But if we're going to focus on that, let's us as older persons also support forgiving the high cost of student loans, supporting affordable education for younger persons. If we're concerned about protecting our Medicare, let's also support universal daycare for young families if we're concerned about protecting our pensions like our UC pensions, let's also as older voters support some kind of a minimum income, certainly for low wage workers and essential workers. So I think right now we're seeing vestiges of reverse ageism. Older persons wonder what younger persons are up to. Younger persons are wondering if the older voters will support their push for a social movement. And I'm hoping that post November, if there's a major change at the top in the executive branch and in the, congression, in the congressional side, that I'm hoping we can once again recreate this intergenerate, intergenerational coalition, much as we saw in the 1930s and in the 1940s. So that's my uh, populist statement for today. Okay, well, I appreciate that from someone with your expertise. I, I really enjoy hearing your, your viewpoints on these topics. And it, you know, it, it, I was uh, in preparation for this conversation. I kind of was uh, looking at the internet a little bit and trying to understand some of these topics. And you know, it's clear that a, you brought up 
financial concerns, you know, for the younger generation, older generation, um, and ageism itself affects our economy. That apparently health costs of ageism are calculated at $63 billion annually, according to one study. And also, quite interestingly, and, and you know, my area is dementia and memory, that uh, a study of people with the genetic risk for Alzheimer's found that those that had a positive attitude about aging actually had a lower risk for dementia. Mm. So it, you know, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're feeling, oh my God, I'm old, I give up. Now that could be a complex interaction. If you're down on yourself, you may be depressed and that could increase your risk of dementia. But I, but I think that it's clear that it's these attitudes uh, harm us, you know, as individuals and as a society. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And again, that's why I'd like to just reinforce my message with the audience that we're we're right now in uh, a very insecure, unpredictable and even scary time. <clears throat> we don't know how long this pandemic will last. We're all hoping against hope that there might be a vaccine by next year. We have our fingers crossed. Certainly we all want to get back to normal, but I'm hoping that out of this crisis, and it's a real collective crisis that this country hasn't faced since the last century, that we'll once again realize the common bonds that we have for each other and with each other, whether it's by age, race, sex, or whether it's by income or ethnicity. And I'd like to bring out as well, I mean, these bonds also intersect with this country's growing diversity. And uh, the issues of nativism and racism has certainly, have certainly been high on the national agenda. And um, you know, we need to recognize that as we get out of this pandemic, by 2021 or 2022, the United States will already be moving towards a majority minority society. And certainly I talk about that in my book. But we also need to recognize that, you know, much of that younger workforce that we depend upon, whether it's for manufacturing, food, retail service, delivering things to our doorstep, is increasingly made up of younger ethnic minority racial groups. And those of us as older persons that have the good fortune to stay in our nice homes and be able to use Instacart need to recognize that we have a connection with them. So yes, how we feel about age and how we look to others about age or their sexual status or racial status is really crucial. But I'm hoping that out of this, Gary, that uh, we're going to move beyond these isms move beyond these isms. And that goes back to that quote by Hubert Humphrey, that we are part of a larger community where what we do impacts on the others. And I hope that's not sounding too naive or Pollyannish, uh, but uh, I really believe that this collective crisis that we are all facing is causing everyone to realize that, wow, whether we are doing well or doing poor, whether we're old or young or Latino, Asian, African-American, male or female, uh, we have a lot of work to do to rebuild that social contract. And uh, the work you do, Gary, with the Longevity Center, the work that I do on the policy and politics of aging, I believe that's going to become even more important in the next couple of years. And so, Anyways, I look forward to hearing what the audience might think about these issues and how we might work together. Yeah, and also, uh, if anybody has any questions, thank you all for contributing your own vignettes of the ageism you've experienced. I appreciate that. Any questions as we uh, continue the conversation, feel free to chime in and I'll try to address them. You know, I, I, you know, I think, I don't think it's Pollyanna-ish. I think that, you know, we've, we've talked about previous, during previous webinars, you know, how this crisis has affected us. And, th and there are some positives. I mean, we are developing grit. 
Uh, we are, uh, if we can get through a crisis, and when it first started, we were all freaked out. Everybody was running to the store to get toilet paper and alcohol. You know, now we've calmed down a little bit. Uh, and, you know, there's a sense that, well, I've solved that problem before. Now I'm not as af afraid of it uh, in the future. So I think that is something. I think it is possible to come together. I'm hopeful we will. But, you know, we're facing issues right now. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about this. You know, there's a, a, it's almost the fall and school is supposed to be back in session. There's a lot of controversy about opening the schools and how to do that. And, uh, you know, some are saying we just got to open it up. These young people are not going to get sick. But when people think that, uh, is that an ageist attitude that they're not considering that the young people would become asymptomatic carriers of the virus and pass it on to their parents and, and grandparents? No, uh, certainly that speaks again towards trying to recreate those intergenerational bonds. And, uh, you know, what I find really interesting also occurring with this pandemic, Gary, is that we're also rethinking how we live our lives and how we're going to grow old and where we might retire if we have that luxury, that opportunity. For example, we certainly know about the tragedy of skilled nursing facilities, and especially those that were not well managed. And I don't want to cast aspersions, but a large semblance of a good portion of them, according to Charlene Harrington from UCSF, are those that were either for-profit or heavily Medicaid or Medi-Cal. And so, you know, there's real questions about to what extent do skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes and packing people into a building, can we continue with that? But there's also other issues that are surfacing from this pandemic about lifestyle choices. Uh, you know, to what extent will people want to live in the central core of cities, whether it's Manhattan and New York City or San Francisco or downtown Los Angeles? To what extent uh, will the movement in the past to move towards leaving your big home and moving towards the condominium or leaving the suburbs, moving to the inner city, will that trend continue? Or will people be so scared and impacted by this current pandemic crisis that it might alter how we have planned our cities and our housing and our transportation projects? So there's fascinating repercussions. Yeah. And I agree with you. I think we're better able at the moment, hopefully, to manage it, although it just really upsets me at the number of young people I still see without a mask and uh, congregating yeah. in public. But there's so much that we're going to have to rethink about how we reconceptualize our lifestyles. Yeah, it's unfortunate that mask wearing has become a political divide rather than just a safety issue to try to protect all of us. So, you know, somebody, uh, there's a comment here, I just want to get to it. Uh, someone said, I love what Fernando said about moving beyond the isms in this collective crisis, and we have a lot of work to do to rebuild. Uh, but I missed the end <clears throat> of that statement. Would you, I would appreciate if you restate the end, do you remember what you said? Uh, at the end of that statement, because, you know, the, the, the sound kind of dropped off. Oh, gee, you know, I... I I'm, sorry if I'm, testing your I'm sorry if I'm testing your memory, but go ahead. Well, the, I come up with these profound statements and I forget what <laughs> the profound nature of that statement was. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, I, I believe what, what I was saying is we need to get beyond the isms and uh, we need to start rebuilding. We need to start healing the divisions and the polarization that we're facing right now in this country. And I hope what I might have said and recreate a social safety net that goes beyond the differences. And if I can just explain that a little bit more. One, one of the things that concerns me right now with the combination of the virus, the social protests, the political polarization is that we're focusing heavily on what's referred to in political science as identity politics, identity politics, where we all belong to a tribe. I'm a Latino, you're Jewish, I'm male, 
I'm fem I'm male, you're male, she's female, he or she is African American, and you know, we go on and on. And uh, you know, at some point we're gonna need to get beyond those kind of identity limitations. The United States is the most heterogeneous population, the most heterogeneous society in the world, because we have historically welcomed immigration and diversity. And, uh, but we're now back towards, let's give this amount to this group, this amount to that group. And this identity politics continues to carve up things into smaller pieces. So that's what I'm getting. It's not just ableism. It's not just ageism, which is sadly alive and well, and, and sexism. It's this identity politics. And if I could, for example, uh, you know, inject a contemporary issue, on the ballot in November will also be an initiative to bring back affirmative action, which we eliminated back in, I think, 1996 or sometime in the back. And, and that really is raising questions uh, how valid is it to have affirmative action for certain groups like Latinos and African Americans, when in fact this greater diversity is giving us Armenians and Ethiopians and Persians and Pacific Islanders and Syrians and Middle East. I mean, we go on and on and on. Now, this might get me in a little trouble because that is not a PC statement, a politically correct statement. But then I got tenure, so. I can do this truth to power. So anyway, the point is, at what point do we need to come up with the things that we have in common and move beyond these differences and move beyond the isms? We've done that in the past. And now I'm hoping in the next few years, as we get beyond the immediate crises, we can begin to rethink what universal approaches should be. And, just to give an example, why do we have Medicaid healthcare coverage for the poor and Medicare healthcare coverage for older persons? Shouldn't it be universal healthcare, regardless of income and age? I mean, that would be, so I'm very much a believer in this Medicare for all. So anyways, I'm, I'm going way beyond what the person's question might have been, but it allows me to inject my pol political oh, philosophy. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. You know, you brought in tribalism and the theme with these issues. It's, it's really a form of xenophobia. People are afraid of those who are different from them. And, and all the, a lot of these isms share that. Now, something that was interesting to me, there was a, a 2002 Census Bureau report that uh, nearly one in five people in the U.S. had some kind of disability. And a lot mm -hmm. of those disabilities are invisible. We don't know about them. People with learning disability, you know, it's not just the problem of having a ramp for someone in a wheelchair. There's a lot of people out there who are disabled and uh, we're not helping them and we're not acknowledging that. Do you, you want to comment on that? Well, certainly, you know, and we're, by the way, just in this week, I believe, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, a landmark civil rights achievement that finally began to give some form of equal rights and uh, access for those with various types of disability. And in fact, uh, one of the favorite uh, terms that we in the and the disability rights movement like to use is to refer to those who appear or think they don't have a limitation, whether it's any of those that we've mentioned earlier, we refer to them as a temporarily able, temporarily able. And uh, meaning that at some point, all of us will face that cognitive, emotional, mental, physical, hearing, visual limitation, certainly, as we all grow older, which by the way, gets back to the issues of stereotypes and the isms. And uh, one of my goals as I work with the disability rights movement and uh, with the entertainment industry is to get away from the myth or the stereotype that to be attractive in the media, on TV, movies, or whatever, that, uh, 
you have to look like you're physically fit and physically able. And it bothers me to no end that commercials and advertisements don't show somebody in a wheelchair or a walker or crutches or obviously with some kind of a cognitive disability. So in either event, we also have to deal with the images and the stereotypes that are prevailing in society about what it means to have a disability and how you are viewed by society. And uh, even AARP in the past has been guilty of promoting in their magazines a beautiful looking 80 year old <laughs> that looks like he or she is 30 year old right. and really promoting this active aging. But the implication is if you're gonna be 80 and be happy and healthy as an active older adult, you have to look like you're 30 year old, 30 years of age. So anyway, we need to get beyond that. And it fits into these stereotypes about ageism and ableism. So, you know, I'm glad that you, you mentioned that you consult with the entertainment industry because this kind of segues into my next question. We're, we're almost out of time and I wanted to leave on a positive note. Yes. And it really has to do, what, what can we do to overcome these isms? I mean, one is to try to uh, make the media more balanced. Uh, maybe uh, contacting policymakers. What, what, what's the, what are the takeaways? What are the action items for all of us to move forward uh, at a personal level and a society level uh, to do better in these areas? Well, I think first we have a personal responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, to feel good about ourselves and to own not just our age. I'm 72 and I feel really good. Although I must admit, I like it when people say, but oh, Fernando, you don't look anywhere near 72. <laughs> that helps my ego, but <laughs> even, even if I know they're lying, but it's still okay. But neither of it, own our own age. But also own whatever limitations we're facing. And uh, uh, when I go out and I do public events, I no long, I don't hide my disability or my use of crutches, you know, it allows me to be mobile, to have a measure of independence. So we all have a personal responsibility to ourselves to not feel, not be embarrassed or awkward if we're using a walker, if we need assistance, but also to work with those industries that have a real impact on how we portray different kinds of persons based on age or sex or disability. Uh, AERP, for example, has a very popular uh, gala event in Beverly Hills every year called uh, Movies for Grownups, Movies for Grownups, which they really extol movies that uh, portray older persons in all their variety, including if they have a dementia or Alzheimer's. And they bring in the older actors and actresses. So there's much that can be done in the media. But at least in my part, when I work on the master plan on aging, and as we're proposed, as we're promoting expanding home and community-based services, and as we're promoting healthy aging, we want to continue to promote the reality that regardless of our limitations, life is still good, and we are still contributing, and we are still valued. And therefore, the images should not be of a very healthy, active, perfectly able older adults. So there's many things we can do, but let's start with our own selves and just say, I'm good, I'm cool, and I feel, and I accept who I am. Well, Fernando, uh, as I expected, this conversation raced by, and uh, I, we could, I, I could go on for quite a while because I love picking your brain and your mind, and I, I really appreciate your coming and joining us today and sharing your wisdom on these you know, very delicate and challenging topics. And uh, so thank you. Uh, I hope we can have you back again in the future. Well, well, thank you. And let me leave it on a real positive note, if I may, because again, my areas are about the challenges that we have to address. I am really excited about the next 10 years and uh, both because we're beginning to see that the older voters are starting to shift towards support for these kind of progressive policies that will benefit young and old. Certainly, 
we have this amazing group of younger generations, whether it's Gen Z, millennials, or even Gen X, we're now seeing the full diversity of ethnic and racial groups that are really coming together in coalitions because they want a better America. So I am hopeful that within the next five, 10 years, we're going to have a really, truly great society. We're going to go through a lot of tough times. We have a lot of things to fix. But uh, this country has always shown that it can bounce back when it uh, has serious issues. And it has always come out ahead. So. I hope I can be around another 10, 20 years in terms of my actuarial inevitability and uh, step back and say that I did, we did, you and I, Gary, did our small part to move forward and uh, make this a better country again. So thank, thank you and you. regards to everyone. Thank you. And I'm going to close on uh, the final comment. I just got in on the Q&A. Great presentation. Thank you for having it. So I think that sums it up how I feel. Uh, let me uh, thank our audience again for their participation and uh, remind everyone our next webinar is August 26, when I'll be talking with uh, Mr. Sidney Mochtinger and the topic will be Successful Aging, 98 and Going Strong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great evening, everybody. Take care.